Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the University of Tasmania online series for alumni, our Explore program. Firstly, as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Palawa people and custodians of the land upon which we meet and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Kate Robertson. I'm the executive director of the advancement team here at the University of Tasmania. And uh, one of the wonderful things that I have in my portfolio is a responsibility for our alumni community. So it's a very, very great pleasure to be able to uh, host this uh, uh, Explore webinar this afternoon. The series Explore provides an opportunity specifically for you, our alumni community, um, uh, to, to have the opportunity for advancement and for enrichment and inspiration. And I don't think you're going to be disappointed today. Um, one of the greatest advantages of being a member of the alumni community is that ability to tap into a group of influential uh, individuals with a vast global impact. This series offers an exclusive opportunity to connect with your peers and find among them innovators, thought leaders, and perhaps even potential collaborators. I uh, would very much value you as an important part of the fabric of the university and uh, why we're keen to provide you with these kinds of opportunities to access webinars tailored to your needs, such as this one this afternoon. And the number of people who registered for this uh, webinar gives us a clue that um, this is an area of, of um, keen interest. So before we get underway, I do want to just run through a few housekeeping points um, and then we can get straight on to the, uh, to the webinar. Your microphone and camera and chat function and the raised hand function in Zoom have all been disabled in order that the uh, speaker is not going to be interrupted during his talk. But we do encourage you to ask questions and you can do this by typing them into the Q&A function that you'll see on your screens. It's extremely unlikely that we'll be able to get through all of the questions. We've already had some come in early, so we know there's a huge volume of interest, but we will do our best to group them together and ask some general topics where there's a, a common theme occurring. And um, uh, we're very pleased that um, Dr. Airy has even kindly agreed to uh, take emails after the lecture if there are people who have a very keen interest in pursuing a particular inquiry. Um, and we'll provide details about that after the lecture. Um, I must say that um, uh, add to that today's presentation uh, is of a general nature and uh, people should speak to their own health practitioner for any specific advice. What De Dr. Airy is going to do today is really draw out some of the research findings um, and, um, and hope that's of keen interest to you. And finally, this lecture is being recorded um, and that means that we can make it available on our YouTube channel for others who are not able to join us today or for your review at a later time. So without further ado, let me get on to the main business in hand today and introduce you to Dr. Raj Airy. He was awarded a PhD in molecular biology by the University of Queensland and has worked as a scientist both in Australia and the United States uh, in the area of gut inflammation and immunology. He also has a Master of Veterinary Science from the Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Sciences University in India and a graduate certificate in teaching and learning here at the University of Tasmania. In December 2010, he joined the University of Tasmania and set up an independent research group investigating topics in mucosal biology, which is gaining national and international recognition. Dr. Airy also coordinates and teaches in the fields of immunology and biochemistry. His specific expertise includes simulation to create virtual laboratories, technical technology enhanced learning, tech teaching and the teaching and research nexus. Dr. Airy's research interests include detecting colorectal cancer in its earliest stages, cellular processes and inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, and bowel cancer, and using anti-inflammatory drugs to treat colitis. His current research projects include investigating the role of anti-inflammatory agent to treat colitis, the effect of bitter melon on cellular stress, and the epidemiology of IBD here in Tasmania. And so without further ado, please let me hand over to Dr. Airy. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I'll um, just share the screen. So it, it's it's such a, a wonderful privilege to be as as a, as an alumni myself to to talk to uh, my counterparts and uh, thank you so much for organizing this uh, area of so much uh, keen interest. How to keep the gut happy? So it, this particular aspect has been gaining a lot of international attention. Um, revolutionizing biology uh, through the topic that I'm going to discuss today. 
So um, I've been working on this uh, gut health area, immunology, biochemistry, basic clinical research and clinical trials in this area for the last uh, about 10, 15 years. So this is a, a passion uh, more than research for me. And so we, um, I'm just trying to get that next. So what we are going to do today is to discuss a little bit about the, the digestive system, um, followed by the most interesting aspect, uh, which is the microbiome. I'm sure many of you are looking forward to that one. And then think about the, the access that's produced by this gut microbiome and, and, uh, and, and what is the emerging area of uh, microbiome therapies. And, and one of the interesting aspects that I would finish with is uh, the importance of fiber and gut health. So first to start with, we know about this human digestive system anywhere from mouth to anus is called as the gastrointestinal tract or the, the human digestive system from your buccal cavity or the oral cavity, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and then the accessory organs, liver, pancreas, uh, and gallbladder. So this is what we know uh, typically from your, uh, no, from our textbooks. But does something in the last five years has revolutionized the way we think about the digestive system. In fact, it is called as an organ. So what is that, um, the new organ? And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world of microbiome. This is now officially in the scientific circles recognized as a human organ. Why? Because microbiome, so let me also define what is microbiome and then the re relative term called as microbiota. Microbiota refers to all the organisms within us, on us. That is called as microbiota. But the, the, the total genetic material that they constitute is called as microbiome. And that is what nowadays we define as an organ uh, by itself. Right? I'll tell you next how, why is it so. But what is interesting is that major uh, journals in the world, uh, they pay so much attention to it, uh, I, to this area uh, of microbiome. In fact, uh, almost every other issue of any major journal, there will be some link between the microbiome uh, and the health, human health aspects. So with that, I just wanted to also tell you, human microbiome does not constitute just bacteria. It's a, it's a sort of a popular misconcept, but it also includes a number of other microbes, such as bacteriophages, viruses, fungi. In fact, you should add the bacteria, add the parasites too. They all constitute uh, what is called as the microbiota and the, and the genetic material microbiome. In fact, we, we believe the, the, what we are is nothing but a super organism. As humans, all we are are the carriers of this huge material called as microbiome. Obviously, it is present everywhere. Once upon a time, in my veterinary medical textbook or in, in, in many of the uh, health aspects, we thought, oh, there are some sterile areas in the body. The concept is gone now. We know there's nothing called sterile in the body. Everywhere there are microbes present. They are present all over the body. And if you take an average person of about 70 kilograms, there is 2.2 kilograms of microbiota. So now you can imagine how much they weigh as well. And in terms of metabolism, I mean, when you do your um, uh, medicine or health science course, uh, you know, they teach you usually liver is extremely busy, right? Because it is one of those hardworking organs that does about 500 functions. But our microbiome seems to um, even um, beat that. So the, in terms of metabolism within the body, it is equal to that of liver or even more than a liver. So you can imagine how much the microbiome is involved within the body. And uh, in terms of the, if you put the genes and all together, and then we are completely outnumbered by one to 300 by the microbes, whereas the cells are outnumbered by one to three or one to five. Now, one may ask the question, are they the same? What are these? Uh, they are present everywhere. We know that. Uh, how are they distributed? I'll define the distribution a little bit later. 
One point to mention here is that the, in terms of methodology to identify the microbes within the body, uh, in fact, it is said that the bacteriophages may be more than the bacteria themselves, but we haven't got tools, enough tools to study the viruses uh, uh, and the bacteriophages and fungi to fullest extent. But we have done so much on the bacterial side. That is why we are able to uh, sort of give the answers in terms of the bacterial distribution. So that is why what we got here in colors in, those, in these pie charts indicate different regions of the body, for example, oral cavity to esophagus, vagina, colon, skin. And then what you find is the distribution is so different. That essentially tells you that they are present in their own niches. So each one has got a niche, and then the distribution is extremely specific to that area. So esophagus has got a different microbiome. Vagina has got a different microbiome. In this case, you can see what is called as a firmicute is predominant in vagina, whereas the, the uh, stomach region obviously is, is filled with what is called as H. pylori. And then if you look at the, the hair or a nostril region, then we have what is called as actinobacteria. So well, just to illustrate that, they, they are different phyla, different species. It is estimated that we got around 1,000 to 1,500 species of bacteria. I mean, in the olden days, we used to do what is called as a culture method. You need to grow the bacteria and then identify them. These days, we have very advanced genetics methods. Uh, that is what is called as metagenomics. That means we can put all the material together, whether it is from a, fe fe a stool, a fe fecal material, or your specific site, and then I can tell you the species. And then there are estimated 70,000 subspecies uh, of uh, microbes within that. So as you can see, it is, it is like a lovely ecos ecosystem. Uh, take a lake or something, how vast it is, how diverse it is. That's exactly what microbiome is. So it is vast, diverse, and very specific. But then you know, one may ask the question, where do we get this from? How do we start? The moment the baby is born, from the vaginal tract of the mother, it is getting exposed. Initially, the, the microbiome of the baby is exactly like a mother's skin, actually, once it is born. And then depending on the uh, feeding pattern and the exposures, the environmental factors, the establishment will happen. So, one, so when do we get what is called as an establishment? Before that, I just wanted to illustrate or tell you that in, in many of the studies, what you find is a distribution like this. They'll say, these are the four most common bacteria that are distributed. These, they constitute about 90%. Within that, if you look at the digestive system uh, as such, the, as you go towards the large intestine, in the colon, uh, the colon is, is mostly anaerobic. That means the, by, by the, the microbes there do not like oxygen. So in that condition, there are so many beneficial bacteria. So by and large, you can distribute the microorganisms, especially these bacteria, into four groups. The actinobacteria, the, mainly the bifidobacterium, bacterioidetes, and then we have the clostridium group. The firmicutes is what we name them. And then the proteobacteria, E. coli, the, the gram-negative. And then we have a number of rare phyla also, but these are the most common phyla that you see in, in a number of papers and, and, uh, and all the articles you read. In terms of establishment, you know, you can ask, oh, Raj, when do you get the, the first establishment? From the baby, when the baby is born, it is like mother's skin microbiota. But what happens then is, as it drinks mother's milk when it's breastfed, what I have done there is the coloration indicating the most common uh, microbes we indicated in the earlier slide, firmicutes, bacteroides, actinobacteria, proteobacteria, these are the most common. Based on the breastfeeding, and then as they get into formula of feeding, then the microbiome changes. So from simply predominantly lactobacillus in milk, and then you can slowly start seeing that the firmicutes coming in, you can see that the bacteria is coming in. But at about three years is what we call as the established microbiota. I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule, but approximately around three years of age, you can see the microbiota settling in. Okay, and then it is firmly established. Okay, so these, but the health style, environmental exposure, antibiotics specifically, and then the malnutrition, all those things will, will, will change the microbiota. So 
it is very hard to define what is healthy microbiota. But by and large, if somebody is you know uh, devoid of uh, smoking and other environmental exposures, not too much of antibiotic, that's what we define as a, some sort of a, a healthy microbiome. And then it it is it is fine until you know you you have a, a metabolic problem, you have poor uh, health lifestyle, then the microbiome is going to change. For example, if somebody is on uh, fish and chips constantly, what will happen is the microbiome will change to digest that. So, I, and hence you get a different microbiota to suit that, not necessarily the healthy one, because the healthy ones will be replaced by the ones that you need for what you eat. So, unfortunately, that is where the the what is called as a change in microbiota, which I'm going to define as what is called as dysbiosis. That means you you from symbiosis, unlike symbiosis, there is dysbiosis. They are not uh, beneficial to each other. <clears throat> okay, in those cases, what is striking is by the time we we turn elderly, say between 65 and 80 years, and so on, there is a dramatic shift. So unfortunately, which I will describe towards the end of this lecture, I'll also talk about the aging and the immune system. So you, you, what you see is the, the, the dynamics of microbiome also changes. Uh, the diversity, diversity is a key word in microbiome. You need as diverse as possible in their proper niches being beneficial is what we call as healthy microbiome, right? So the diversity gets lost as you get older by multiple factors, which we'll describe a little bit later. And then I'm just going to illustrate with predictors of skin microbiota and how the various factors play a big role. Uh, once again, age, the lifestyle, stress is an, an important factor. There is a little bit of genetic predisposition. Uh, obviously, diet is a major factor. And then hygiene, drugs and antibiotics, another big factor. Together, you, what, that is what is going to change the microbiota, and that, that involves microbiome, microbe host, and microbe, microbe interactions. This is what I talked about in terms of niches. For example, you know, uh, dogs have got that, that uh, area marking, right? So they utilize their pheromones in the urine to, to mark it. Similar demarcation exists within the microbial ecosystem as well within the gut. So very basically, they're all defined regions of where each one resides. So by our habits and, and multiple other factors, once you change them, others will occupy. So from beneficial, less beneficial, in fact, pathogenic, that means uh, horrible uh, uh, disease causing ones can take those parts. This is what is going on with respect to what I define as dysbiosis. And that leads to altered interactions and then conditions affecting skin. I just need to explain to you a little bit about what are the health benefits? I mean, you, you just talked about healthy microbiota and said it is almost like, uh, uh, like a liver, like an organ. What do they do? In fact, the, the conju in, in terms of one important aspect that we figured out is the primary bile acid to secondary bile acid. That means bile is important for fat digestion, but then who does the, uh, the sort of, once it is done the job, how do you convert primary bile into secondary bile for beneficial effects? microbes. And then in within the metabolism of the body, now we figured out using what is called as metabolomic techniques. That means you can actually figure out what the microbes secrete. Okay. So there are methods now to say uh, the, they secrete certain small molecules, certain amount of fatty acids, proteins. We have come to that stage now in research where we can say there is a specific metabolism, say, for example, amino acid metabolism done by microbes. The most important one, most well-researched is what is called as short-chain fatty acids. So these are the, what are called as magic molecules these days. There is at least about $8 billion industry depending on short-chain fatty acids just to talk about uh, you know, butyric acid and how we can utilize it in human health. And then the, the choline metabolism, which we'll talk a little bit later also. So what I'm trying to say here is in terms of human metabolism or how we digest all types of food, sugars, proteins, uh, fats, uh, the nucleic acids, microbes play a major role in all that. In fact, this is one of our contribution to this area where we said how the microbiota protect from pathogenic infections. 
In fact, what you see in the in this figure on the left side is our gut, if you see the lining of our gut, it has got two layers of protection in terms of the mucus. So it has got a, a sort of a thin mucus and a thick mucus. So the second layer, what you see in yellow on the left is a thick mucus where there is no entry to microbes, okay? And then that actually, the protection is given by healthy microbiome. They are the ones that keep that wonderful dynamic equilibrium within the, the intestine. Once you deplete them by as, uh, the factors we discussed, multiple factors, including antibiotics and diet, then the pathogenic organisms gain entry. So this is where we call it as leaky gut. So they are able to enter and touch the epithelial cells, then havoc, it is havoc. So that is when the immune system goes crazy. And, and obviously this is the sort of thing that happens in inflammatory bowel disease as well. Microbiota are so important for maintaining the uh, barrier integrity. So this is a term you will hear a lot. That means how do you maintain that single layer of epithelial cells intact and the microbiome is playing a huge role. I mean, one may ask a question, how do you know all these things? We have learned a lot in the last 10 years through what are called as germ-free mice. This is the major contribution and how we understood it is actually the microbiome and nothing else that is so important for generalized human health. So if you take germ-free mice and, and you don't have the microbiota in them, then they, you subject them to multiple experiments, then you realize how important. For example, they do not produce the immunoglobulins needed uh, in the gut, for, namely immunoglobulin A. So that is how we are able to assign how important they are for each of these things, such as the mucosal integrity. And this is a point I already mentioned. This seems to be uh, one of the central themes of microbiome, and namely the production of short chain fatty acids. So we have three major short chain fatty acids, acetates, butyrates, and propionic acid. So these are the major uh, SCFAs or short chain fatty acid. What happens is basically the microbiota within the colon are experts in digesting uh, fiber. That's the reason fiber is gaining a lot of strength because they love it. The bacteria living within the colon, they seem to prefer these sorts of fibers. And then they, they, are, not, they are not just travelers there. They in fact do a lot of good things for us. What they do in turn is production of these. And why, what is the function of these? These short chain fatty acids energize the entire colon. So the energy is given by them for the colon to survive there and, and, and be happy. And so this, that is why this aspect has gained a lot of interest. As I said, this is an industrial uh, uh, thing now, as in multiple companies have arisen and they are manufacturing what are called as the magic molecules, namely short chain fatty acids. But in nature, the microbes are able to produce them and then in turn, uh, they're able to travel to other parts also. That is why we are able to link the gut microbiota to, for example, diabetes, to uh, multiple sclerosis, or other aspects is because of these. They can travel remotely. And in fact, it is now, the research shows that even the microbes can also travel as well. Uh, I, I mean, I don't have time. I can do a two hour lecture just on this gut brain axis alone because it is now learned how important this, this aspect is, how the microbiota basically talks to uh, the brain, uh, you know, mainly this vagus nerve uh, through the serotonin metabolism, GABA and tryptophan metabolism and how it is important in, in multiple aspects of human health, including appetite control, cognitive behavior, and uh, neuroprotection and neuropsychotic conditions. In fact, there is a group of uh, new drugs uh, utilizing the microbiome called as psychobiotic so important in that area. So due to lack of time, I can't discuss too much, but uh, rest assured that these gut microbiota and brain axis is playing a big role in, in future therapeutics. Now, if you all put it all together, because I can't list uh, the, the functions, there are so many, but if you look at this wonderful figure here, what it shows is if you put the gut microbiome, microflora right in the middle, what you find is gut 
bone axis, gut skin axis, gut brain axis, gut kidney axis, gut heart axis, gut liver axis, and gut adipose axis. In fact, they also talk to the uh, the fat uh, in, in and through the hepatoentric circulation or liver circulation. So what basically it shows is number of bacterial derived products, including the short chain fatty acids and other things. They they do a lot of things. Uh, they produce all uh, lots of other me uh, metabolites as well. They are the ones that play a major role in what is called as the uh, homeostasis or healthy function of the human body. Having said that, as a researcher into inflammatory bowel disease, I just need to explain to you the, the overall, how do you get these sorts of gut inflammation? You do need some sort of genetic polymorphism. There is a slight amount of genetic predisposition. In the disease I study, inflammatory bowel disease, there are at least 210 genetic loci that are known to predispose uh, to say Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So you do have about 15 to 20% of the, uh, the overall disease can be assigned to genetic uh, predisposition, polymorphisms. Then what happened is there is what is called as um, methylation, genetic modifications, okay? Uh, in the whole overall term, we call it as epigenetics is associated with genetics called as uh, DNA methylation, acetylation, and so on. All these put together as epigenetics plays a big role in this also. And then uh, we just discussed how important with the intestinal microflora is playing a role in this and a number of environmental factors. We now realize how environmental factors are so important in disease pathogenesis, um, antibiotics, um, in uh, the consumption of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, stressors, all these together culminate in intestinal inflammation. The ones we study here, this is uh, ulcerative colitis. So this is the sort of uh, pathology that is understood. But uh, one of the most important factors is the gut dysbiosis. It is believed that by 2025, one in four human beings uh, will be dysbiotic. That means it is, it is going to result in a number of uh, disease conditions because of the dysbiosis uh, within us. And once again, I alluded to how it is created by, by number of environmental factors, including major play by diet. So put it all together, if you, if you look at the left and right, the healthy condition, and then if you take, for example, metabolic disorders, if you look at the left, this is a healthy sort of condition where the microbes play a major role in uh, the, the, the mucus and then in also producing the short chain fatty acids, which in turn keep the gut healthy. And they are so important in immune immunity as well. Human immune responses are defined also by the microbiomes. So resulting in good energy intake, blood glucose maintenance, the moment you lose that because of dysbiosis on the right, as it is shown there, the metabolites from the microbes um, are not there, propionate, butyrate. Uh, and so what happens is the, the signaling, the bacteria that talk to the epithelial cells is lost. And hence you are exposed because of this dysbiosis, number of functions are lost. That results in uh, uh, you know, dysregulated energy intake, blood glucose and metabolic disease. Just as an example to show how we are, you are arriving at a model wherein the metabolites produced by the microbes are so important. So I'm not going to scare you with this, but just to illustrate, if you put all this research together and say what happens because of altered microbiome. So on the left, whatever you see in red or pink, those are the problems, reduced uh, SCFA production, short chain fatty acid, increased endotoxemia, increased gut inflammation, insulin resistance, because what you see in green are the, the beneficial effects of the microbiome. So um, they in, increased antioxidant, in, uh, you know, improved lipid metabolism, low gut inflammation, all given by the microbe is lost. And hence, we are, we are, what we are seeing is the reduced amounts of all those uh, beneficial things resulting in a number of conditions. One thing I want to um, talk about uh, importantly is the microbiome and cancer, especially colorectal cancer, because this is the area we have uh, worked and published where yes, the, the lifestyle is important, but what we have uh, now come to understand is scaringly is there is a specific group of microbiome in a dysbiotic colon 
that can give rise to uh, colorectal cancer. Namely, there are three organisms that have been shown clearly as uh, causative agents are called as the mucosal drivers of oncogenic promotion or cancer causation. So those are the ones I listed there in red, B. fragilis, E. fecalis, and E. coli. And that is through wonderful research published in top class journal. So it is because they're, the, the interesting thing is these pathogenic organisms are able to cause damage to our DNA, which is usual form for cancer formation. Secondly, they produce xenometabolites, that means, opposite of beneficial uh, metabolites, they produce the wrong ones. So they are able to cause a lot of damage and cancer causation. So in fact, it is very clearly proven so far in a number of uh, colorectal cancer cases, how these guys are associated with colorectal cancer. I want to show one specific example of how in the disease we study, namely Crohn's disease, uh, where one particular organism has been implicated. And so uh, basically there is a, a very protective organism called as Fecalibacterium presunitsi, uh, okay, FPRAS. So what happens on the left side, what you see is a healthy ball. This is a colon. You can see the lovely epithelial layer, a single layer of epithelial cells. And then underneath in the submucosa, you have the inflammatory cells. What you show on top is the, the fecal bacteria uh, species that maintain that wonderful uh, healthy atmosphere there in the mucus. So what you see is a layer of mucus on top. So all they need is please supply me with fiber. I'm happy and I'll give you and keep you protected through a, a functional mucus layer and, and a very uh, you know, beneficial effect. But the moment there is lack of fiber or lack of this organism because it is completely disrupted, say for example, antibiotics or, or a severe dietary change, then the opportunistic microbes and the toxins will build in there. And that causes reduced mucus layer. As I already told you, reduced mucus layer is a recipe for disaster in the gut. The mucus layer goes down it is like uh, getting rid of water, then you can see the, the, the bottom. Similarly, you can see the epithelial cells. The organisms can see the epithelial cells, then it is havoc. That is when the inflammatory cells go crazy and they secrete all sorts of chemicals and cytokines that gives you the inflammatory condition, okay? So in terms of, yeah, this is the point I wanted to earlier talk to you about microbiome and cancer. What you see here is specific bacteria and their products, for example, colibactin, the red thing from E. coli, the red, uh, reddish thing called as colibactin, or the F. nucleatum, E. fecalis, the orange one is E. fecalis, green is F. nucleatum. What do you see this opposite of beneficial bacteria? These guys secrete things that are proliferative, that means cancer causing, inducing angiogenesis. They, uh, they stop cell death and hence they promote uh, tumor promoting inflammation. So this is the sort of latest research that is arising to show the importance of maintaining uh, you know, symbiosis and the opposite to dysbiotic bacteria. And if these guys gain upper hand, they can cause uh, cancer. So all in all, what uh, we're trying to say is, is can, can we, have a fingerprint of microbiome. To some extent, yes, because at the moment we have what is called as the, the bacterial side of things covered. We, we have gone advanced level in terms of sequencing the microbes uh, that are bacteria. So for example, in IBD or IBS, uh, IBD, we know there is a reduced firmicutes. And remember the four bacterial groups I said, the common ones, yeah. Within that, the firmicute are extremely beneficial. And once you get rid of those anaerobic organisms, then, um, you know, for example, Fecalibacterium and Ackermansia, they're all a form of a part of that firmicute. So once you reduce them, then you, it can result in inflammatory bowel disease. And then irritable bowel syndrome, there's a lot of interest. In fact, it is predicted that between 12 and 15% uh, of us in Australia might have uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And there is a, a you know, the firmicute overgrowth, uh, overgrowth of certain uh, unwanted ones, for example, Clostridium cluster uh, uh, 14A, uh, and there is a decreased amount of bacterioides. So, what we do in terms of bacteria is there are two things. One, we say diversity. How diverse are these bacteria? 
and then we can also quantify them. That is how we are able to arrive at the species level and say, look, you got less of uh, this particular recurrence musnephilia. And so it goes on, the list goes on for multiple pathological conditions, and then we can arrive to some extent at a microbiome fingerprint. I mean, in future, uh, within the next 10 years, this is, this is definitely going to be there. You know, when you go to a doctor, you'll get your personalized genomics and then microbiomics done. And then based on that, you can get the drugs uh, uh, organized in terms of treatment. So there is a microbiome fingerprint that is available in, in a number of conditions. And, and moving on to, okay, you talked about the health areas and then the problems associated, but can we manipulate them? Can we utilize the microbiome in terms of therapies? Yes, we can. So there are four angles uh, in which the, the industry is looking at utilization of microbiota, um, diet, probiotics, prebiotics, and the combination uh, of pre and probiotics called a symbiotics. So this is the area we've done a lot of research and published quite a number of papers in the last five years showing that symbiotics are how uh, beneficial symbiotics are. And, and there are multiple reasons that we have shown why that is so. And then finally, uh, to finish with uh, fecal microbiota transplantation, I think the most exciting translational aspect of microbiome is that FMT, uh, fecal microbiome transplantation. Coming on to the diet aspect, the, the research repeatedly shows that diet not only rapidly, but also reproducibly alters the gut microbiome. That means the question answered here is, look, I've been on a long time, you know, so-called uh, poor diet, too much of fried substances, not enough vegetable fiber material. Can we change it? Yes, you can, because diet has been shown, uh, it depends on the person. So it could be a few weeks to some people, it can go up to a year to change that to uh, what is uh, defined loosely as a, gut, a healthy microbiome. So if you see this figure, what it shows is if you take a plant-based diet and the diversity we are talking about, not altered, whereas if you take the animal-based diet, it severely impacts the diversity to the negative side. That means the, there is less diversity, the beneficial bacteria are not available. The basic reason we understood in research is, for example, if it is too much of meat all the time, what happens is the bacteria have to shape themselves accordingly. And hence, what happens is the diversity is lost. You get more of something that is important for that. And that is why you lose that diversity. And and the, the, what you see on the right as A is the concentration of short chain fatty acids. The plant-based diets are extremely useful in producing a number of short chain acetate and butyrate levels go up with the plant-based diet and hence the gut is happy. Uh, and so the, the next part, I mean, you can talk uh, forever about this probiotic area. Um, one thing to remember is, you know, if you go to a chemist, there are hundreds of them, which one to take. That is a very contentious question because we have no answers to that at the moment. You no, know, the probiotics click, for example, even our clinical trial, which we'll talk about later, worked beautifully in children. And the, not every probiotic is for everybody. No, it is probably you know, some probiotic which are specific for your gut will work like magic. Then you have a wonderful establishment and that works for you. So at the moment, I can't, hands on heart, I can't say, oh, all probiotics work. So, but we know from a number of clinical studies, probiotics are extremely important and, and they make a lot of difference to keeping the gut happy. So in fact, the lactobacillus, all the beneficial bacteria such as Ackermansia can go up and in, in turn, they produce uh, short chain fatty acids with probiotic uh, therapy. What about the FMT? I mean, this is an amazing uh, success uh, in terms of translation but still there's lots of questions to be answered. So in fact, you, you know, some of you might've seen the, the homemade kits for producing this by yourself. So uh, never buy a second hand blender because you could be in for trouble. So uh, what do you do? Number one, stool from a healthy donor. See healthy donor definition is not as easy as you think, uh, but you know, nevertheless, so so-called healthy donor can get the stools. You can process them. Nowadays, you can get them into pills so that it's not enema or, or given uh, you know, in your anus. So it, the, basically the delivery type now is through the mouse or nose, and then uh, you, you get the, uh, the fecal micro. Here, the, the thing is, it is not just bacteria. The whole thing, uh, that is what I like about it because the entire ecosystem along with the, of the microbiome is transferred. 
But there is also a catch in it because we said you could transfer a lot of other things, uh, including moods and other things, uh, uh, you know, multiple traits along with the fecal uh, microbiome transplant as well. And so if you, if you ask me, Raj, give me one biggest success in microbiome therapy, here it is. Biggest success in, is in what is called as Clostridium difficile infection. This is a, a terrible diarrhea condition that leads to death. Um, if, uh, if be, be, here what happens is because of repeated antibiotic usage, people go on to first become antibiotic resistant and then this severe uh, extreme diarrhea will, will kill by this infection called as Clostridium difficile. Now with this uh, fecal microbiome transplant, I mean, it is, it is ridiculous because it works much better than the traditional treatment. In fact, some trials have to be stopped because of that reason where they used vancomycin, which is a normal therapy, uh, doesn't stand a chance before this fecal microbiome transplant therapy. So if you take a week eight resolution in these people, uh, okay, put together, there is about 92% uh, success rate uh, with respect to C. difficile infection. That tells you something. And here is the real success of microbiome, according to me. Number two I've seen is this one organism that is uh, talked about a lot is called as Ackermansia mucinephilia, mucin loving mucinephilia. So basically it helps improve metabolic syndrome in uh, obese subjects. It is, it is, you know, watch the space because this is going to be a therapeutic angle very soon, but the biggest success is FMT for C. difficile. Okay. So, and uh, one interesting aspect I wanted to tell you is about a research where they showed, oh, you know, we know that people who deliver babies with uh, cesarean section, those babies are a lot more prone to allergic disorders. I mean, you might have figured out because the microbiome doesn't reach, uh, because the vaginal microbiome is so important for the initial establishment of microbiota within the children, okay? So if you don't have that, there is dysbiotic problem and that leads to allergy and so on. So what they have done is, if you take a vaginal swab during birth, and then if you if you just uh, take it in a container and then just swab, uh, put it on the baby's mouth, face, and rest of the body, beautiful results. It is as equal to a baby that was born by vaginal section. So that shows you how important the initial microbiota transfer from mother to baby is. In fact, I always tell them the microbiome. Uh, is actually even before the baby is born. For example, the mother is not consuming a uh, good uh, diet, uh, fiber and other good vegetables. And then, then also uh, if there's smoking involved and alcohol, and that actually impacts on the baby as well. And finally, the, the fiber. This is the sort of a magic word these days. Why? Because these fibers are the ones that are allowed by the bacteria. So this is, that is why they term this as prebiotic. Probiotics are live organisms, whereas prebiotics are the ones that the bacteria allow. So the, that is why they probably the combination is better because they, they consume these and then secrete the, uh, the important metabolized short molecule uh, that are important for gut health. So fibers, uh, there is, you know, very difficult to classify them. There's a huge range of fibers. You can class them, uh, classify them as water insoluble, which has less fermentable or soluble fibers that are more fermentable. For example, your cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, they are all under the insoluble fibers. And then the soluble fibers, pectin, gums, mucilages, they all form under that. So your, your typical vegetable sources, cereals, uh, fruits, legumes, sugar, uh, potato, all sugar, uh, sugar beet, uh, so they all come under the insoluble fibers, and then the, the gums, uh, leguminous seed plants, all those come under the soluble, but a product can have both, a combination of both insoluble and soluble fiber. And so each one has got uh, their own beneficial, but by and large, what we have seen, I've reviewed a, for a major journal where it showed fiber, uh, how it is actually, through the epidemiological studies they've shown, how it is protective against uh, colorectal cancer, the consumption of uh, fiber. So how do they work? Once again, uh, as we uh, discussed earlier, the, the fibers are metabolized by bacteria uh, within the large intestine, and then they create the short chain fatty acids uh, and the biomass. So what they do is they, they promote the regularity and aid in bulking. Uh, so 
you know, you can see in this table I've provided here, the fermentability varies between uh, various fibers. For example, resistant starch is almost 100%. And, and then uh, some of them, uh, hemicellulose a little bit less, cellulose even less. So what do they do? Why do we talk so much about fiber uh, these days? It's because they add bulk to the diet, so it makes you feel fuller, and hence they can reduce the appetite. They lower the LDL cholesterol, which is the, the bad one. They regulate blood pressure. They add bulk to stool and hence alleviating constipation. They facilitate regularity. In fact, uh, our own research, which I'll discuss describe in a minute, shows uh, wonderful beneficial effects in clinical conditions. And as I said, reducing the clinical uh, risk of colorectal cancer as well. So coming on to the, the last part where we know we have been working on a number of uh, products, uh, microbiome products uh, in our own research work. For example, we did a study on children on antibiotics to show that uh, when we did a clinical trial, this is a randomized clinical trial in children in Launceston, we showed a positive effect where we could reduce the diarrhea effect in children with probiotics. But the most exciting one we have done recently is the second one for heartburn, where we showed a sugarcane uh, prebiotic uh, can basically reduce uh, heartburn effects. Fantastic, and I think that is a future where we are going to discover a lot of effects of these fibers in a number of gut health conditions. And so, and the other area of interest to me is aging. So we have done a lot of work on the metabolic profiling in aging um, uh, mice, and then currently we've started work with humans also, where we showed certain uh, probiotics uh, might be beneficial in reversing those effects. So that is, watch the space, because that's where we need to work on to help our elderly people with respect to uh, changing their microbiome to, to be more beneficial. Number of people ask questions about the aging on uh, immune system. There is a lot of uh, work that shows that immune system and microbiome both uh, if you like, go down in terms of in, a, in a negative way because there's a, a sudden change in microbiome diversity. And then what you also see in terms of immune system is the, the cell-mediated responses, the humoral responses, meaning the, the antibody levels go down, protective responses go down. The thymus size is almost gone. There is non-existing thymus. That means the T cell function, which is really important for immune system, is altered. B cells produce less antibodies compared to a younger person. So these are natural phenomena related to uh, senescence or immunosenescence. But one thing I recently gave a, a full one hour lecture on how to boost immunity in the elderly. I just want to summarize for the benefit of those listening. And so what we want to summarize is sleep pattern is extremely important because it is directly linked to immune system. Uh, stress is um, adequate exercising is important. Fruits and veggies and supplementation with antioxidants, namely vitamin C and E, and then the probiotics and functional foods play a big role in immune boosting in the elderly. So if you want to summarize with the, the time, so I just wanted to summarize and finish here with the trends and future directions. I think we are going to have what are called a synthetic microbes because we are associating with them, but is it causative or is it just association? We don't know. At the moment, there are only rare instances where we can uh, nail, pinpoint a specific microorganism that is causative. So the research will tell us, but then we are going to have synthetic microbes that will be the key uh, for future therapies. I think personalized nutrition is the way to go because each, what I have also realized in terms of this understanding the microbiome is each one is different. Regionally, we are different. Race-wise, we are different. So we need to have an algorithm for each of us. Metabolism is the key because at the end of the day, what you need is the metabolic product that is produced by the microbes that are going to play an important role. So yeah, I think personalized nutrition is the name of the game where we are going to have the thing that works for you. And the markers of health are so important in this case also to identify. There is a lot of uh, problems with respect to regulatory process at the moment uh, with all these products, but it will all be uh, soon over. So in terms of challenges, to me, one of the biggest challenges is what is a common microbiome? I mean, if you look at all the microbiome assembled in the world, uh, you, there is about 15 species that are common. 
So how do you define the common microbiome in humans? So the answer I think is it, has got, it is going to be varying from region to region. So you cannot say this is a common human microbiome at all. What about non-bacterial microbiota? At the moment, we are focusing too much on the bacteria. So the, we need to understand the importance of the viruses, bacteriophages, for example. In fact, the bacteriophage therapy is going to be a, a game changer pretty soon as well. Now, also the importance of fungi, microbiome, how they, in fact, uh, work with the bacteria, viruses, bacteriophages to give us the gut health. Local versus distant effect. What I mean is the gut-specific short-chain fatty acid effects versus how they travel to remote places such as liver, pancreas, and how they impart health. We need to study that more. And then the regulatory challenges with that. So in conclusion, I would say microbiome, an organ, is an important link to health and disease. Lots of unknowns at the moment, but we, were very, we, are, we are progressing fast with research, including our own work. And, and there are some specific examples of manipulation. The biggest success is in C. difficile, but more and more human studies are required. That is why my focus, my lab focus, is on human clinical trials. Uh, common methodologies have to be defined much better. There is a lot of promise in this area. I think this is the area of that that's going to produce a number of miracle uh, molecules for based on personalized microbiome therapy. Because we also remember, we also need extreme computing. Because what we are talking about is trillions and trillions and trillions of cells and the sequencing and the assemblage, and so that is the other aspect that we need to develop to get this going. And then there are many challenges, a lot more clinical studies are required before we put uh, and say, here is a, a bacterial or a cocktail of probiotics that that will cure this particular disease. So with that, I would like to thank a number of collaborators, gastroenterologists based at uh, Launceston and other places, Utah's uh, faculty, uh, all my students, a number of uh, my PhD students who are postdoctoral fellows in many countries, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, biopsy, other material donors, and so on. And also uh, funding aspects, because I work with uh, a number of industrial partners. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank all of them uh, for their generous support. And I'd like to finish there and uh, take some questions. Thank you very much for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you, Raj. Gosh, uh, so much material to cover. And we're sorry that uh, we've had to really squeeze you into just this short sort of uh, lunch hour slot, but that was uh, fascinating. Lots of really great uh, insights into the research uh, there. If you don't mind, Raj, I'm going to uh, do work very quickly to get through some questions. And I'm going to kick off straight away with one that's coming around. Uh, somebody asked the question, and I put the caveat, you're not here to give medical advice. You're talking about um, the uh, the research and what that tells us. But somebody's asking, what can they do to cure their um, irritable bowel syndrome? Yeah, I mean, look, this is a common question. I mean, at the moment in 2020 also, unfortunately, we are still unable to uh, say define what is IBS, right? Irritable bowel syndrome is a syndrome of number of things. And, and is there a microbiome link? Yes, definitely. So if you look at this uh, particular uh, uh, slide here, where they, this is from the Canadian Gastroenterology Association, where they talk about therapeutic approach in managing the microbiome in irritable bowel syndrome. I mean, unfortunately, there is no consensus about the microbiome uh, variation, dysbiosis within IBS. Uh, each study is, is, is a little bit different. But what they think is, you know, if you have a positive diagnosis based on, you know, abdominal pain, change in frequency, symptoms for at least three months, and the other symptoms, I mean, this is the standard ROM guidelines, right? And then you have IBSD or M or uh, C classification, which would a clinician would have done, your clinical gastroenterologist. Then what they think, this is a thinking at the moment, it hasn't translated fully yet, but the thinking is like this. The combination is important here. So you do have microbiome-directed therapies and non-microbiome therapies together uh, for much better uh, 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 results. For example, IBSD, they think probiotics, uh, rifaximin. And uh, M uh, I, for C, which is milder, and you, you can go with probiotics, but then the antispasmodics uh, and the uh, TCAs and other drugs should be continued, which is the non-microbiome directed therapy. So the answer at the moment is uh, it is a work in progress. Unfortunately, there is no definitive uh, microbiome directed therapy in, in, in IBS yet. 
Thank you. And and for the lay person, what would you say would be um, who, who's concerned about or just wants to improve their gut health? What might be the top three things you would suggest to somebody like if, if the significant things they could do to improve their gut health? Absolutely. See, diet is the factor. So as I said, uh, you know, you can consistently rapidly change the microbiota towards a healthy aspect. And as I said, fiber is a keyword. If you're not having enough fiber, I mean, I, I haven't gone into details of the quantities needed by the guidelines. So basically, you know, you need a lot of fiber that can give so much beneficial effects. Number two, probiotics, I can't say, you know, individually which one to choose, but something will work out for you. So it is more of a trial and error. You need to try. They, they don't have side effects, so you can keep using them. So that will be the, the second aspect. And microbiome also depends on exercise and all the other health aspects. So you need to follow all those guidelines. Reduce red meat because the, the amount, if you consume too much of red meat, it is not good for you. And um, uh, some questions came through around the benefits of fasting. So whether whether actually sort of clearing um, intake of things into your gut is a, is a good way to restart your gut health. I mean, is, do, do you have any thoughts about the role of fasting in good gut health? Absolutely. Oh, phenomenal uh, work has been going on. Yes. So I would say even as a, as a follower of this, I myself have done is especially the intermittent fasting aspects of it. They kickstart back the, uh, the microbiome into a positive level. So essentially, as you as you reduce your uh, the 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 you know the more fat burning and then towards a stem cell mobilization, as you increase the amount of uh, number of hours of fasting, the microbiome seem to respond to that positively. So yes, the answer is yes. Thank you. And somebody's asked um, about um, you've talked about the benefits of a plant based diet and high fiber diet. Um, what do you what's <coughs> Excuse me. Do you have a view about those uh, non non meat meats like Beyond Burger, Impossible Meat, Omni Pork? Are they beneficial? Do you think there's a place for those in the diet? Basically, the the, the aspect of balance comes in because, as I said, too much or sing, similar aspect of food, for example, consumption of something regularly is 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 not good at all. Because, as I said, the important change dysbiotic bacteria is because you are feeding them the same thing. Uh, which is not beneficial. So the most beneficial is uh, dietary fiber because that's what they love the most. Number one priority for bacteria in the gut is fiber. So that will be the number one. Others are okay because the the group of bacteria will digest all other things also. But providing them with the you know deep fried junk material is not going to help at all. All right, and then just one last uh, question is really around uh, COVID. Do you think that the role of um, increased use of sanitizers and so forth is problematic in terms of uh, maintaining um, healthy uh, biomes, uh, microbiomes, given given we're sort of killing out germs wherever we can? Yeah, absolutely. No, this is my concern too, and and I think we'll only know a little bit later. I mean, we you know one hand we we are you know sanitizing. The the hygiene hypothesis is based on that actually because you kick out all the important beneficial bacteria by sanitizing, then what happens is the allergy and asthma, autoimmune disease goes up. So the future, within the next five years, we'll get to know the amount of sanitization now will yield a lot more uh, negative effects or not. Oh, well, um, Dr. Eri, thank you so much. We're really out of time. There were so many questions, but um, as I said at the start of the um, presentation, um, he, uh, Dr. Eri has very kindly agreed that uh, you can uh, put in a, a question by email and the email details are available on your screen. So he won't be able to answer all of them, but um, he'll do his best to get through a few of them out of the session. But I would just like to take this opportunity to thank you so much, um, Dr. Eri, for your time and great insights and for sharing your research with us. Um, um, so if you can all join me in silently thanking our speaker, um, Dr. <laughs> Eri, thank you for that. Um, thank you very much. This is a really great example of um, the expertise we have here at the University of Tasmania. And um, uh, I, there is plenty of opportunities. Somebody asked on the questions whether the presentation is available. Yes, it is. We'll put it up on um, 
Um, the video will be available via the Explore website uh, very soon. And again, details of how you can access that will be provided to you. There is an opportunity to take part in another engaging webinar. Um, that's coming up on Thursday, the 29th of October. And we're going to be joined by entrepreneurship expert, Dr. Bronwyn Eager, and leadership expert, Dr. Toby Newstead, both from the Tasmanian School of Business and Economics. And they're going to be exploring how to navigate yourself and your teams through the COVID-19 landscape. So again, very topical uh, subject there. If there's anything else you'd like us to explore, please do let us know. Or perhaps you're a member of the alumni community you'd like to share your expertise uh, with the community. So um, please do reach out to us. The details are on your screen. But for now, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again, Raj. Really loved having you here. Thanks for your time and all you've put into to making it a wonderful webinar today. Um, have a great day, everybody.